Live from the Green Room Studios, from the spacious property of Bates Nursery and Garden Center, 3810 White's Creek Pike, it's the At Home Show with Josh Carey and David Bates. And good morning, everybody. Welcome into the At Home Show. I am David Bates, but that is not Josh Carey. That's Adam Chapman. He's sitting in alongside again today. Uh, we're... Josh is taking another Saturday off here. We really appreciate you all tuning in. And uh, welcome, Adam, and welcome, Tyler. I hope you guys are both doing well today. Morning, sir. And we're going to yep. get into a bunch of questions. Uh, but first, we're going to get into the usual here and uh, discuss the weather. And uh, we'll look at the radar here quickly first. This tells quite a bit of story there. Obviously, there's a lot of precipitation, some to the south, but mostly to the east of us. That, that means that uh, as we get into our forecast here for this uh, weekend, we're going to be uh, looking at the reality that rain is going to be a possibility probably late in the afternoons. Thunderstorms, again, are a chance tomorrow. We've got seasonably mild temperatures, 78 Today, 81. Tomorrow, 77. On Monday, and partly cloudy conditions with a, you look at these overnight low temperatures, 57, 56. That's pretty awesome. That really makes you feel like autumn is well on the way. Although, as we move through the week, it does warm up a bit. We do get into the upper 80s for high temperatures, but still, uh, I believe it's a pretty good indication of drying air, which certainly makes those warmer temperatures a lot more palatable. We don't, you know, the humidity of August hopefully is uh, getting away from us. Although this morning it is a muggy feel at 69 degrees here in the Music City, live from the green room here at Bates Nursery. And welcome in, everyone. And we'll also want to welcome in our participants and our our cast of characters on the opposite end. We got Joy Bovin. Welcome, Joy. Good to see you here Good again to you. today. Here. Austin Lowen also in, and we're going to be talking about uh, whatever you have questions about and anything with regard to plants. Actually, we'll answer questions on anything, no matter what your questions are. We'll have an answer. We don't know if it's correct or not. <laughs> I was going to say it's, it's not a horticulture. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll answer promising. it. We'll get you an answer. So don't be worried about that. So good morning, guys. Uh, how's everything going? Going good. We're getting ready, aren't we? We had a big week of trucks this week. So yep, back hurts. Uh, yeah, we had a lot we of heavy were discussing, lifting. We were discussing the fruit trees that just arrived uh, yesterday afternoon. So we're still working on those, trying to get them all situated and tagged and all that. So if you come out today, particularly early, uh, you might select fruit trees that have yet to get an actual tag on them. Now, they'll have an ID tag, but they won't have the our full pricing information, a barcode on there, but we'll be working on that, as I hear, immediately after the program. So th- those are always a, um, a little bit of a challenge. Not all suppliers are uh, completely versed in the... Uh, Pre-tagging. Technology of yeah. bar, yeah, they don't understand the retail concept. All they understand is we grow them, and <laughs> we put a picture tag on there, so that should be enough. And uh, it's really not enough. One thing people- we did get in that was interesting to me, you might find interesting, David, is we got some fifteen-gallon fig trees. Mm-hmm. Fifteen? I've, yes, gallon. I've never seen a fifteen, well, uh, a and, number and, fifteen. And trees. which cultivars are these uh, 15 I was gallons so busy getting it off the truck, I did not look. <laughs> I just saw that it, they had figs on them, and they were bushy, which is what they're going to be anyway here right. in Tennessee. So I've uh, just never seen that before. So Yeah, the, uh, the only fault I would say to the way that Monrovia grows their figs, and they, the ones specifically that they grow on the West Coast are mm-hmm. in a tree form, yes. which just means... For those of you don't understand what I mean when I say tree form, it's a single trunk that branches out at the top, and it looks nice, and it's very good for shipping purposes, but they won't maintain that form here in Middle Tennessee. When winters come around, as they frequently do, they get killed back to the ground or get at least a lot of tip dieback. Mm-hmm. So that they wind up being multi-stem plants uh, mm-hmm. as time goes along. So if you buy one that's a single stem, 
I promise you, it will not stay that way unless you take some extraordinary measures to insulate the trunk, and uh, most people are not going to do that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I believe we have questions in the queue. Am I correct on that, Tyler? Yes, we do. We've gotten a lot. Um, So I guess you want to kick it off already? (laughs) Well, I mean, unless you've got something else you want to discuss, I mean, there's there's all manner of things going on as we transition from summer into fall. Obviously, technically, we're still in summer. We've got 10 days 10 or days, so yeah. before, 10, 11 days. before we get into the, the technical uh, fall season. And sometimes we get into fall and it still feels like summer. So... We'd never know for sure which way that's going to be, but certainly with what we had for summer this year, it already feels like fall because uh, it's not above 100 degrees. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, June June was brutal. It's great to have some precipitation and cooler temperatures. We can all deal with this rather well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we have to gear up, you know, before fall. We can't wait to get to fall before we get all of our stuff. We've got to get it in the summer so we can have it in the fall. Uh, So this week, good Lord, um, we got a truck from Saunders Brothers that was very large. On Wednesday, when I wasn't here. When you weren't here, thanks again. That truck was kind of my fault. (laughs) I put most of it together. I think think he pays Julie off so the (laughs) trucks come in on Wednesday. Uh, It's one of the biggest we've ever seen. Don't tell everybody. Yeah. But they're out of Virginia, and God, they do a good job growing. I mean, oh, yeah. really beautiful I'll, plants. Yeah. No, they they really grow a lot of boxwood, but that's not all they grow. So, kind of give us a, a little brief overview of what we got on that truck. Shoot, I mean, the hydrangea selection they had this week was insane. Everything pretty much in full bloom. I mean, and showing, looking great. Or they do a great job with perennials in Joy's Land down there. It's, I mean, everything came in bloom. They had some flocks on there. It was gorgeous. Yeah, um, yeah. they've upped their game on proven winners a lot, too. They mm-hmm. had, we were excited about it because there's a lot of new introductions for 2022 that we haven't seen yet that were on that truck. Mm-hmm. Like puffer fish and <laughs> yeah. Invincible Sublime is a really cool one. Mm-hmm. The hydrangeas It'd be are, nice yeah. to get new introductions for 2022 or any given year in the springtime as opposed to the fall, but better late than never. That's so right. we'll take them. Yeah. And, and, you know, with as with all uh, new introductions, it, you know, you have to take some time to be able to uh, determine – just how wonderful they are. Joy, you recently went up to uh, up in Michigan and got to witness firsthand a lot of the uh, proving grounds on uh, these new v- cultivars and varieties on the proven winner's side. Talk about that for a minute and, and, uh, and what all they do to be able to make these new uh, varieties that are that come out as the you know, the new thing, the latest and greatest every year, and uh, how difficult that process is. Yeah, it was neat to kind of see how they operate because they're they're a big marketing company, um, but they they've got a shrub and tree location, which is the one that we went to go visit, which is Spring Meadows. But they also Walters Gardens grows all of their perennials. Um, there's a I think it's called Pleasant Valley or. Nope, that's not quite right. But it's in New Hampshire, and they grow all of the annuals. And then they have a new one, Leaf Joy, in Virginia that grows their houseplants, which they're about to push forward. But it's just a really – they the facility for their trees and shrubs, um, I think they, they have 180 patents there. And it's all liners, so they've just got building after building of uh, – just short little trays of liners, and then they ship them out to growers who grow them on, which is why we're probably just seeing introductions now. Um, I got you. Because I think just the way the industry has been the past couple of years, nobody can keep up. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But seeing seeing these mature, they had a puffer fish growing on their property, and that was it was neat to see these new introductions before they're pushed out. Um, and there's also, there was also a Sambucus, I can't, um, straight laced or something laced up. Mm-hmm. They had one of those that was full size. That was unreal. Yeah. 
And that seems course, like that's the good thing about proven winners, hence the name, proven winners. They test it for us pretty mm-hmm. much. So they're growing it to make sure that every all those traits that we really want in the garden are going to perform in our garden. So they've done kind of the work for us so we can be confident that we can buy those plants and they're going to perform how we want them to in our yard. Yeah, 2% now, enjoy- of their trial plants actually make it as a proven winter product. Just 2%. That's what I was going to ask yeah. you. What percent of the plants that they try actually make the cut? Yep. I mean, is it like 10% maybe? They throw away a lot of plants. (laughs) They do. And they won't let you touch those that they're throwing away, right? Nope. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think that uh, that gives us a good opportunity to see what is uh, on people's minds. You know, I sent you some pictures earlier, uh, Tyler. Mm -hmm. Do do we want to do that now or do we want to wait later and uh, check those out? Sure, let's tackle this question first. Okay. So, one moment. Dun, this, dun, dun, where, this dun, is the moment dun, dun, of tension dun. where the at home show screen appears. The reveal. Oh. There it oh. is. Hey. Okay, so do we know what conifer this is? What do you think, Austin? You haven't seen it yet. To me, it looks like a Deodar. Yep, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's, Deodor. that's the consensus. That's, Good old yep. cedrus. Uh-huh. A yeah, true cedar. This is, yep. I'm assuming this is northern Florida. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I can't imagine. Uh, Cedars Deodora in Miami, in no. Central, no flow or, you know. as, the, as they say. <laughs> yes, but uh, yes, uh, this is a question was submitted by uh, Selena Rudd, our good friend, who uh, who was a one time employee back in the day of Bates Nursery. So, Selena, there's your identification: uh, Deodora Cedar, or if you want to do it uh, botanically, Cedars Deodora, mm-hmm. and that will. Uh, and they they do grow well in Middle Tennessee area. Mm-hmm. They are, uh, uh, but they don't really do well a whole lot further north than Nashville. They will freeze out if they are. Are they uh, zone are seven more. or are they zone six? Seven. Uh, okay. Well, I think you know, cashmere, you know, that cultivar is a zone six okay. listed as that, but the regular uh, genus and species of Deodar is seven, I believe. Okay. So you can do reliably well with them uh, here. Uh, but if you try to go a lot further north, you may have issues. I will say I have seen three in Maryland, but it was on Rehoboth Beach. So it so was kind of coastal. Coastal, 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 coastal yeah. yeah. It was a little bit different. Um, yeah. But they were yeah. big. They were like 40 foot when I saw them. I was really impressed by mm-hmm. those. Deodar Cedar is one of my favorite conifers. They are fantastic. You know, we got some golden ones in this week, yeah. and the golden ones light up in the spring. Really, really beautiful golden chartreuse foliage uh, with some kind of green tucked in behind that. Really good plant to grow. It's they're beautiful. Really if you can pretty. grow it up against something that has a lot of contrast, mm-hmm. that pops it out even more. They're making that yeah, the you, focal point. You probably want to put them where that they're not right up against a uh, like a west facing brick <clears throat> wall because particularly the golden cultivars, they yeah. they don't like the extreme Radiant heat. heat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They really uh, they, it tends to make them look fried. And so if you have them a little further out or have some kind of a cushion planting in between, that will uh, give them the ability mm-hmm. to not have to uh, withstand all that reflected heat off of a wall. They'll likely do a lot better yeah get yourself a nice little island bed out in your yard you know make yeah. something new make that your focal point in the center of it and then build around it and it's a because as you mentioned that. they're going to get big they do i mean mm-hmm. at given time I, adam and i were talking before the show I, I know of at least one in east nashville i'm guessing it's 70 80 maybe 90 feet mm-hmm. tall it, it's huge uh it's i don't know uh uh, you know, it's so big that the it no longer looks like a deodar. The foliage hangs straight down in mm-hmm. panicles like it's a pendulous plant, but it's just because the weight of the foliage grows is bringing it straight down. Right. The, uh, the photosynthesis cannot pull that back up. The weight of the actual foliage is, mm-hmm. uh, is weighting it down. So it's pretty interesting to see how that uh, they can – Every now and then you see something that gets in the landscape that has a, a different kind of look once it fully matures, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which fully mature is not a phrase that we use around here at Beach Nursery a lot because uh, <laughs> we, 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 we seem what do you struggle say? in demonstrating that. Uh, Speak for self. yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you know. Uh, so, what, can I say one more thing on uh, Cedrus? Yes. Sir. So years ago, I guess it was almost maybe eight years ago, I planted some Carl Fuchs, which is a cultivar of mm. Cedrus deodara. 
uh, in East Nashville, and they were about six feet, and they're, they're close to where I live now, and now they are, I don't know, 15 feet, but that's supposed to be a more columnar one mm -hmm. that the tag says six feet wide. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing my own trial of how mm -hmm. wide they actually get in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little bit bigger than the tag usually. And yeah. also, we ought to clear the air real quick, y'all. We talk about cedar trees. These are true cedars. This is Cedrus deodara. There's only four species in the whole genus. And those are true cedar trees. What we call cedar trees out in the landscape are technically junipers. junipers. Yeah. So let's clear that up. Yeah. Well, you know, mm -hmm. Common names can be tricky for us out here whenever you come at us with some common names. So if you want a juniper or an eastern red cedar, uh, this is what we call them commonly but they're technically junipers is what you're seeing which is our native juniperus virginiana right. is what they actually are mm -hmm. and uh, somewhere in virginia i guess they were first identified the name <laughs> would suggest that mm -hmm. so uh, uh, and it's very the and it's a great point you make austin about the difficulty of common names you know you can uh, you can go across town and they call the same plant something different mm -hmm. so you know if, no matter where you're going in different regions or whatever the common names are not have not proven to be reliable with respect to identification because mm -hmm. your grandmother might have called it something different than your next door neighbor does so mm -hmm. the the uh the latin the uh, genus and species really doesn't change doesn't change in whatever language you're in because it's still latin mm -hmm. that's right and it's kind of funny, we call eastern red cedar here juniper, which is what it technically is, but then they call on the west coast western red cedar, mm -hmm. which it's is technically an arborvitae. Yeah, yeah, it's a food, yeah. <laughs> right. yep. Different genes altogether. So, <laughs> confusing. Uh, so confusing. Mm. But it's all good. Cypress is yeah. another one. People use cypress just loosely all mm -hmm. over the place. Uh, cypresses are, are pretty, you know, as specific as well, so... Either way. Well, then it's there's hard. also cryptomeria. Exactly. Japanese red cedar. Japanese red cedar. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. I think it's done a lot to create a um, a mystique to make it feel more exotic. You know, it makes it sound Cyprus. smarter. <laughs> but you know, you don't. There's nobody growing any Maltas that I grow of. Only Cyprus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a geography joke. Anyway, oh. <laughs> what else okay, we got? All right. Well, and I just tapped off of that there. Uh, okay. So, starting off our questions. Uh, Aaron Melissa asked a few. I'm going to kind of spread them out through our broadcast today. But we'll start with flowering plants that will have blooms through the fall and return next year. What do you think, guys? Okay. Through the fall? Well, I mean, there's the obvious, which is the uh, knockout roses, which will bloom until first frost. Uh, and even the drift roses will do that as well. Mm -hmm. Adam, um, one of your favorite, Abelia. Uh, Abelia will do the mm -hmm. same thing. Blooms on new growth all season up until... Uh, frost. Mm -hmm. Buy it out, I'll bill you later. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. um, no. What else is there? What else? Well, perennial land. Oh, yeah. Ironweed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Goldenrod. Salad Saladago, yeah. Also, the uh, what we have behind Tyler there, the uh, panicle hydrangeas. Some, I mean, they can, if you prune them uh, at some point after they've done their first flush <laughs> and bloom, they can bloom again if it's a long enough uh, growing season. So. Mm -hmm. What else is there? Is there anything else? Now this is, they will have blooms Aster. through the fall and return next year. Just double checking. I don't know if through the fall means through the winter. No, nothing through the winter. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've had, I've had, uh, I've had my knockouts. I've got blushing pink knockouts. I've had them blooming on Thanksgiving Day, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is pretty I mean, good. That's impressive. It just depends on the weather. So yeah, yeah, you know, and, and the nature of knockout roses is, is they. They barely go dormant. Yes, I mean mm. they they could shed their foliage and immediately start pushing new growth. And I've yes. seen them do that. It's nothing unusual to see them starting new growth in January if you have a, a, warm a few spell. warm days, yeah. or mm -hmm. if they're in the close enough proximity to the foundation where they're getting reflected heat off the house. They respond to change in temperatures a lot more quickly than most plants do. They just really want to grow. They're growing machines, and there's no uh, secret why they're as popular as they are. They, even despite some of the the problems that are associated with roses in general, uh, they well, are still very popular. Right. Well, and and actually, the problems that roses mm -hmm. have, uh, the biggest problem they have, can be laid at the feet of knockout roses, which is rose rosette, because. Mm -hmm. right. 
you know, used to, that was a disease that was pretty much just known in rose growing circles, you know, decades ago. But now because they're so ubiquitous throughout everywhere, exactly. everybody has to deal with it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, okay. And, and in all parts of the country. So yeah. nobody seems to have gotten around it. And really the only, the best thing to do if you've got a plant that's affected by it, is just dig it up, clean up all the foliage that's on the ground underneath. But the good thing is, is because it is a virus that is spread by mites, as long as you have sprayed and uh, you don't have uh, mites on your other plants, you can go mm-hmm. ahead and immediately replant. It's mm-hmm. not going to reinfect uh, necessarily. Right. So you can put that back in there, cut your other ones back to make a mash if you need to, and uh, move on. Mm-hmm. All right. And speaking of moving on, we'll get to the next question. <laughs> uh, how to prune a crepe myrtle. That's right. from Connie uh, Bell twenty nine on Instagram. <laughs> it's a trap. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> because there's different methods. There are. It kind of depends on how you want to do it. I, I know there's a big stigma about crepe murder. We all heard this, and this mm-hmm. is true with large growing crepe myrtles. Whenever you just clear top them, they just don't look all that great. And then they come back with kind of knobby stems, you know, on the on the topmost growth of the plant. And it doesn't look quite all that great. So it, how to prune a crepe myrtle is, you know, I could talk about this for a while, but really the way I like to see a crepe myrtle is a multi-stemmed, vase-shaped growing plant. So we have stems that are outward from each other, but still growing in an upward fashion to a canopy that's up atop of that. Now, uh, one thing you ought to do is, is at least you are going to shorten a little bit because that makes a nice bushier habit on the top of the plant. So we want to shorten a little bit, but we don't want to just go in and just clear-cut main stems if we can help it. We do want to remove all the seed heads that are up on the top. That's going to help out with growth. Um, And we want to prune anything, any like sucker growth. So things that are coming up from the base that are smaller than the main stems. You know, I want to try to get to a three to five main stem system if we can help it. Um, But you don't have to. You can go eight to ten main stems. Well, what I've seen, Austin, is the more mature the crepe myrtle, the less suckers it seems to have. True. Very uh, and then all, but also what you have to be careful of with with crepe myrtles, particularly with the newer um, red leafed ones, mm-hmm. is they will prune themselves because they're not <laughs> that hardy here, uh, cold mm-hmm. hardy. So a lot of times they will die to the ground in the winter. Uh, mm-hmm. They won't kill them, but yeah. you'll you'll have this shrubby thing that's about six foot tall every year, pretty much. Yeah. And this phenomenon that we refer to in the industry as crepe myrtle. You know, they where it doesn't really kill the plants, but they they do look really bad. And my contention is is that uh, was adapted by maintenance companies, landscape contractors who are maintenance companies that are doing or looking for things to to do in the winter time. Mm. And uh, so they tend to just start clear cutting the tops back, just flat on those. Uh, it started in commercial areas almost exclusively is where you saw that and it kind of slowly spread to people doing it in their homes because they see this being demonstrated out in the uh, public domain so to speak and they falsely believe that this is the way it should be done so Mm -hmm. i've got some natchez which are easily the largest growing of crepe myrtle at my house and we they've been in the ground for a number of years now, they're quite large, but we're able to retain the natural form, but we don't flat top them on top. We have had to do some cutting back on them, but when we prune them, we, you know, we try to maintain the, uh, like a crown on them that keeps it looking in a natural shape. So that when they start pushing out new growth, they don't lose that, uh, that growth habit that we're all so fond of. And you don't get mm-hmm. that popsicle look, mm-hmm. which is, you know, the uh, ugly part of that. They do grow out of it by the time you Pretty get quickly. late in the season. Pretty quickly, mm-hmm. yeah. But it's, uh, it's not a good look. Yeah. So, hey, let's talk for a minute about uh, getting the best growth you can get out of your plants. And that's by using Earth Mixed Garden products. And if you're uh, out in about the Middle Tennessee area, even on up into Kentucky and Indiana and Southern Ohio, the, you're going to find locations at independent garden centers and other premium sellers of uh, soil products and you're going to find the earth mix product line actually you can get a list 
by going to earthmix.net and click on the Find Earthmix tab. I'm not going to do that right now, but it'll give you a list of the map of all the pins, and you can click on a location, and uh, once you do that, you can actually go on a location-by-location basis and see which of the Earthmix products they carry. So if you're looking for Earthmix landscape products, for instance, you can find out who actually has that and where the location is nearest you. So we invite you to check that out. Only the best garden centers and independent sellers sell Earthmix garden products. So what makes it different than other products? And Adam, I think this is a, a question I want to pitch over to you. you know, there's a bit of no small effort given to trying to uh, develop a line of products that are not just organic, but are viable, productive, and really are difference makers in how well plants grow off and uh, continue yes. on to maturity. Yes. Well, that's that's the important thing is, you know, you have to under, understand the biggest thing about a good soil is it is living. It's a living soil. So it's going to have all kinds of microorganisms that you can't see. Uh, beneficial fungus uh, that we call mycorrhizae, also bacteria um, that humic actually, acid. yeah, humic acid. Um, but the mycorrhizae, the, it lives near and on the root hairs of plants and it helps plants take up nutrients that otherwise would not be able to. So, uh, and that's what we've done with uh, our uh, soils. Uh, you know, anything that has our supernatural uh, compost in it is inoculated with those things, with, with mycorrhizae, humic acid. Uh, so it's a living soil. It's a great soil. Uh, you know, and, and no matter what you're doing, if you're just amending your soil, uh, we've got the landscape and the supernatural. And if you need to actually bring in a whole new medium to plant straight into, we've got the garden soil. So. You know, and interesting, uh, there is research that supports the uh, idea that through uh, mycorrhiza fungi and the relationships that mycorrhiza have in the soil with the root systems of the plants, that actual communication between plants occurs mm -hmm. that allows them to be able to adapt to pests and predators mm -hmm. to better defend themselves. So. Uh, even though it might be communication on a chemical level or on some other level that we don't fully understand, uh, what is well understood is the benefits you get from use of products that have uh, high values of uh, endo and ecto mycorrhiza fungi, humic acid, and what it does is it enables plants to be able to grow at a wonderful, healthy level without the use of chemical fertilizers. And if you're trying to grow a garden uh, for vegetable plants in particular, that, of course, is really important to you. And whether you use Earthmix Garden, so named because it is a great soil to use for your uh, vegetable garden, if you're, in, if you're going to do that, or any of our other products, such as Earthmix Landscape, which I mentioned earlier, a great all-purpose premium soil conditioner, whether you're planting edible landscape plants or fruit trees or any of your other landscape plants, it is uh, a spectacular addition to amending your soil to help you get through those times. If you want to do the best thing for drought tolerant plants right now is plant them right now and the drought tolerance you'll gain the benefit of next year. So if you want to get yep. earth mix again, Check out any of the wonderful sites. Go to earthmix.net. Click on the Find Earthmix tab. They're all there. Remember, this success in gardening begins at the ground level when you use Earthmix garden products. Make sure you support all the great uh, sellers of the Earthmix garden products in the network. And we appreciate you giving us a moment to talk about that and to uh, help you understand uh, you know, how to have the best success in planting. There, there are factors that are outside of the control. People talk about a green thumb. Uh, a, a green thumb is really just having an understanding of what the basic needs of plants are in, in providing that for them. And if you don't take the proper measures when you are planting, uh, you already are stacking the deck mm -hmm. against yourself. And that's what we try to talk here at Bates Nursery, and that's the, the same message you get at other uh, independent garden centers where that, you know, this is all we do is uh, sell plants and talk about plants and how to get the best uh, growth and most productive and have the fewest problems. So a green thumb is not something that you are magically born with. It's something that you could actually learn if you don't, feel confident in your abilities and we can teach you.
Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of, you know, we talk a lot about a, a ton of different plants. We sell a ton of different plants here, different species, all, whatever, they, all across the board from the tallest tree to the smallest little house plant. But what David just said is you got to get back to the basics and the basics of plants, all plants across the whole world is water, sunlight, and nutrient. And that's just what, that's the most basic. If you can get those three things down and figure out how to do those. Now, obviously there's some plants that like more light than other plants. That doesn't mean they don't need light. They still need it. You know, people tell me all the time, especially in house plants, you know, what I've got a really dark area and I want to put a plant there. What can, what can do well? There are certain plants that can do that well, but they still prefer to have sunlight. They don't want to be in a dark corner. So we just need to know that if you get those three things down, specifically water, as right after you buy a plant and you take it home and you want to plant it either in a pot or in the ground, water is the most crucial thing right off the bat. You've got to get that right. you got to make sure that it is moist around the root zone where you just planted it. That's where we have to keep the water. If you do that, then you're starting yourself off right. If you fail to do that, you're going to see quick problems and quick problems in plants typically mean an underwatered scenario you mm -hmm. know if a plant is overwatered it kind of takes a while for it yeah. to die it starts to look rough it gets off color but it's a it, it's a long process if it's underwatered it's quick y'all it goes fast especially like big trees you know in the fall this is our big time tree planting season we just got a massive semi yesterday with a whole bunch of new trees on we got more coming next week and people want to plant trees in the fall, which is a great way to do it. But you got to make sure you keep them moist around the root zone. If you do that, you're going to be you're going to have success. The deciduous trees are going to latch in; they're going to do great. But if you fail to give it enough water early, you're going to see a quick death, and we do not want to see that. So yeah, and one of the problems with uh, getting enough water is that not all soils are created equal that mm -hmm. are that people are planting. Matter of fact, if you're in a new development, a common practice, unfortunately, is that the topsoil gets scraped off the mm -hmm. entire area and it gets sold to uh, someplace down the road mm -hmm. and you're left with this subsoil that they put a skim of topsoil back mm -hmm. on so they can grow grass. So when you excavate a hole, you, uh, you, you go through the top two inches and then you're immediately hitting this kind of subsoil perhaps churdy subsoil yeah. it's very hard it's it very has compacted. no nutrient value really yeah. and it has no organic material no. in there and that's why that if when you add organic materials through your amendments uh in your soil that is a difference maker in how much success you're going to have going forward. Mm -hmm. And you don't have a chance to do that at any time except when you're planting it. A lot of people will erroneously think, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do it later or I'll, you won't do it later. You can't do it no. later. And, and if, if it's a budgetary thing, put some plants back and get the, some the products that you need yep. to, to grow the ones you're growing well. That way you can be assured you're going to have the best success. And in all defiance of rest and relaxation, uh, Josh Carey commented, is kombucha made from that mycorrhiza fungi? I'll just answer it right now. No, no, <laughs> negative. Not not any kind of kombucha you'd want to drink. <laughs> you no. could, you might be able to get some compost tea out of it, but not yes, not which kombucha. that that's a healthy drink for plants. Yes, so do that's do kombucha that. for plants, do Josh. Do that. I've never had kombucha. What is that? I don't it's really a know it's that. a fermented um, tea like uh, drink. Yes, it's the bacteria feeds on the enzymes from the. It's <laughs> it is not, pretty gross. It's not gross, Joy. <laughs> it creates. Well, I mean, it's from a digestive standpoint. It's purported and widely believed to be really healthy for you, as far <laughs> as uh, giving you, you know, you know. We talked about living soils, and you know, we're all living organisms. So yep. even though the the uh, things are different than that animals need compared to plants, uh, there's still a lot of uh, bacteria and fungi that are involved in all the living organisms. So you can't get around it. You need to have them. Mm -hmm. All right, switching back gears to our questions. What can I put in my deck planters for a great fall look? Well, you're looking at, you're looking at something, yeah. most yeah. of it. Yeah. Do we have options for that? Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, if you just want to get through the fall season, we can make a beautiful mix container for you or help you do that. Uh, we've got plenty of plants, especially if they're protected. We've got a lot of uh, uh, brassicas, which are going to be your ornamental, not all ornamental, but there's a lot of ornamental, say, cabbages and kales um, that are really attractive foliage-wise. Um, we've got a purple leaf cabbage up here that's actually edible. This is one you would put in the garden, but we've got a lot of them that lo have that similar look. Um, that you can bounce other colors off of. And there's a number of plants, pansies being the biggest one, that are going to last kind of through the winter. But a lot of those plants that we sell, if they're protected underneath the cover um, and given enough good sunlight, can make a beautiful pot. And, and gosh, there's, like I said, the options are almost endless right now. We could even go with just like evergreen shrubs if you just want to keep a you know a green plant for the winter. Uh, maybe you want to get a Christmas tree out there and put some lights on it. And that's my radio. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to hey, turn Joy, it on. talk for just a moment about you know you know we have uh, all kinds of ornamental plants. We have ornamental cabbage and kale, and we have the garden types. And really, those are are functionally the same plants, but there's a difference in the way those plants are produced, and that's yes. what is the difference maker and why you would eat one and not the other. So talk about that for a moment. Yeah. Um, so we do. We have ornamental. At ornamental cabbage and kale and Swiss chard, and we have them separated in our greenhouse for a reason. Um, the ornamental type has been treated on the grower side of things. We don't treat anything that isn't biological or organic. Um, and then, then we have all of this, which is is safe to eat. And so we we try to stress that as much as possible. And we've got signage that says that, so that you wanna you wanna make sure and choose the, make the right choice. Yeah, the thing the, about the ornamental The stuff. ornamental types might have chemicals yeah. mm -hmm. or they yeah. have used to produce them to keep them clean or whatever. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. the only... That's how they and got given that the, the <laughs> yeah. passage of some time, those will flush Degrade, through the yeah. system. Right. Yeah, but hence the name There's ornamental. A, we want to keep them pretty, and that's what they want to do too. Mm -hmm. And there is a really bad insect right. pest out there. It's an imported cabbage worm that we all need to get familiar with that eats every one of these plants that we have out here and they'll make holes all in the leaves and make them look very unsightly. So in the vegetable garden, uh, we can kind of deal with this by hand picking, if we will. Um, that, that takes work, but it's, it's the organic approach. Look on the back mm -hmm. sides of the leaves and pick off those worms and live with a little bit of damage. You're going to see it y'all. It's part of it. It's part of vegetable gardening. You're going to see some holes in leaves. Now, Austin, uh, on that insect, could you not use, um, uh, thoracide or BT? Yes. Okay. yes most okay. definitely. That's, yeah. Which is an organic yeah. approach. That's what we use in the greenhouse. Okay. Mm -hmm. And coverings. If you yeah. got a small enough plot, it's easy to cover it with some insect netting. Mm -hmm. Observance, yeah. another, I talk about it every, each week, looking at the backsides of those leaves. are going to be little eggs on the backsides of leaves in clusters. They're going to be mm -hmm. kind of all together. Go in there and pop those eggs and never let them hatch. I mean, that's yeah, the that, most organic. That's probably the biggest mistake that people make is not spending enough time just mm -hmm. physically going through their plants in their garden areas and looking at them and inspecting them. You can avoid all manner of problems uh, by simply staying attuned to what's going on in the garden. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you, if you're a regular about that, you won't prevent everything, but you'll certainly mitigate a whole lot of the issues that will mm -hmm. come otherwise because there's just too many different pests. You can't assume that everything's going to be okay because – everything's going to get affected you know everything in nature is trying to make a living mm -hmm. and so if you're trying to preserve the things that you have in your garden you need to be able to do what you can to be able to uh, ward off those uh, problem plants and mm -hmm. those pests that attack them i should say and i can um, speak to this go ahead joy sorry no go ahead i was gonna go back to the container question oh. yeah because that's the original question yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead Okay, you so problem people. since I'm down in the perennials and annuals all the time, um, be creative. There's there's kind of this idea of what a fall container should look like and should be as far as the material that's used. Um, but a lot of our annual growers are going back to just supplying summer annuals for fall containers like Calabricoa or Supercals. Um, Celosia. Yeah, Celosia, Coleus. And even now, there's a, at the bo the box stores. There's a lot of uh, croton mm -hmm. that's being used. So, and then you've got perennials or that you can incorporate. <laughs> or crotons, either one. Crotons. My, people might think they put that on a salad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're a little crunchy. <laughs> um, yeah, and so there's also perennials that you can use. Virginia or pig squeak. Coral bells is a great one. There's some sedges that you can throw in there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then we have also started bait signature arrangements here, which it's just in its little baby infant stage at the moment, but we want to get it to where we're supplying more of our homegrown containers that we've put together ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, now, one thing you, you have to be, one thing you got to be careful with is the, you know, with those, like you're saying, the summer annuals, it's great to get in there, but uh, you know, when you have a frost or a freeze, they're, they're gone. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you don't protect them. So uh, just have to be aware of that, you know, yeah. what you got in there. But so. they'll, they'll last longer and bloom longer. Not, I love a mum, but oh, it's yeah. a game. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. you've got to play it just right. Yes. And please don't choose mums as what you're going to use for the wedding. Yeah, that'll never. <laughs> it's, you're well, going to be disappointed. One of the main mums. weddings will, will look good with mums. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, and, and mums are a perennial that should absolutely yes. be used almost exclusively as an annual, in my opinion, because a, you know, a mum, when you put it in the ground, a year removed, it has taken over. Yes. I mean, it takes way, I mean, unless yeah. you are sharing it, vigilant sharing it, about sharing cutting it, it yes. I mean, cut it multiple times yes. during the season to keep it in check, it will, it'll just take over. So, you, you know, mums are great. And there, one, it's a reason why that they were used a lot as just a pot plant, uh, because they it kind of predetermines their life cycle somewhat. But you put them in the ground, uh, you're going to have them, and they're going to take over an area, and you might not want that area taken over. They are, uh, you're going to get a lot of color out of them. And if you do choose that, don't be afraid to cut them, even all the way up into the beginning of August. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could cut them to the ground in August and have them reflush back set bud and they'll last much longer if you do that frankly because you will have them budding up in the cooler season when they bloom uh, too early the cycle is really short mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. yeah and also uh, one more thing to Adam's uh-huh. point for for things that are going to last past the frost the perennials and also we bring in a lot of like one gallon and smaller container conifers to throw into containers mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. And if you do use those summer annuals and we do see that we're getting into the fall and you want them to last longer than the first frost, guys, just put them in your house overnight. I mean, just don't let the frost get to them, you know, for a night, you know, they're not going to hurt anything to bring them in. And then once the weather warms up the next day, set them back out. So just be mindful of the weather. Keep the freeze off of them and you can extend that that mm-hmm. life period. Mm-hmm. Well, I like to tell people that when they're struggling with this, hey, you know, my annuals are still looking so nice. I hate to pull them out. And, you know, if you want to get just, you know, we'll give you some uh, old used containers if you want to pull them out and transplant them. And that way you can enjoy them on the patio or give them as a gift to a friend or whatever. Then go ahead and get your planters replanted for the appropriate season, be it fall things for this time of year and going into the winter or in the springtime, pulling your cool season plants out, your pansies, violas, that kind of thing out while they're still looking good and putting starting in your spring summertime uh, annual. So it's it's always the difficult decision when you're in those transition times. Is I can't stand to destroy all these beautiful plants, and you and you need to be thinking about getting those out because you need the time to be able to get the the following crop established before the more severe weather approaches. Well, it's like anything else, you know, the more you do something, the more experience you get. So the more, uh, you know, the better you get at it. So, you know, the more you garden, the more experience you get, the more you've seen. So you, you kind of get into a rhythm. You kind of know, okay, this is when I need to do this. This is when I need to do that. So, but we're here, you know, if you still have questions you know, we'll, yeah. we'll, We'll be Bates, glad to help you. Well, so. the Bates Nursery Facebook page has a question from Kelly Sue. Do you recommend spring or filtered water over tap water treated for plants? Um, you know, I don't know that there's that much of a difference to be honest. What do y'all think? I, I, it depends on what we're talking about. I, I mean, where yeah. you're at, I guess. I guess water all, all all over the place is different. A little higher pH, a little more calcium in some of it, I guess. Um I've never had an issue with tap water all that much. Um, I will say Mother Nature's rainwater seems to do the best. Yes. I mean, yes. by far yes. the best for watering Everything plants, so. always perks up when it rains here. Way better. Yeah. I mean, it just is. So if you can get, you know, try your try your hand at a little rain collection, you know, yeah, spot. Rain, a rain barrel or yeah, something. Yeah, a big rain barrel yeah. and water with mm-hmm. that if you want to. Like I said, the, the rain just seems to perk everything a lot better than tap water does. But and tap water I, I does know, work. I th- 
I think it's partly a ionization issue. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is, is that rainwater will not have chlorine or fluoride mm-hmm. in it. And yeah. there are some things such as spider plants, if you're into like hanging baskets or indoor plants, that it's, it's well understood that they don't like fluorine. So if you're th- at least take your water and draw it out of the tap and leave it sitting open for. It'll gas uh, off, a, right? Yeah, it'll yeah. gas off. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, speaking of gassing off, why don't we, uh, tra- <laughs> why don't we, we uh, transition here and talk about Bates Nursery and Garden uh, Center for a minute? Now, we're not just blowing smoke around Bates Nursery. We we like to have a lot of fun, and you know, gardening should be uh, an enjoyable endeavor. And what we try to do to help make it more enjoyable, it's not just giving you the the broadest spectrum of plants, trees, shrubs, ground covers, ornamental grasses, you name it, perennials down in Joy's area, natives, all those things. Uh, We try to give you expertise to help you figure out how to best use all those things, get them at a spot where they have the best opportunity to have success. See, we want you to get the right plant in the right place the first time. That's the way we do it at Bates Nursery and Garden Center. Now, here today we have a plethora i mean a wealth of information in studio these are uh these are seasoned professionals that this is all we do we don't you know we don't sell plumbing or paint uh in the slow season we are horticulturalists all the time and we all the endeavors that we do are to that end whether it's in trying to give you the absolute best soils and amendments such, such as the earth mix garden products to grow your plants in uh, to looking at your specific location and saying, well, here's what it appears to be your light conditions. And here are the things we suggest that are going to give you the best results and are not going to uh, have you frustrated as a gardener. You know, a lot of the, the frustration gardeners have are simply lack of information. That's where we excel. Uh, and as the uh, 17 time winner of best of Nashville, uh, we really take that seriously. We we're we really want to uh, help you become and and stay an avid gardener. There's so many benefits to gardening, more than just the growing of plants. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that there are great beneficial uh, psychological benefits to getting out and digging in the dirt. What is sometimes referred to as the Prozac effect of digging in soil that there are 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 really not well mm-hmm. understood but uh recognized properties that digging in the actual dirt there is a uh a antidepressive effect mm-hmm. that's associated with that so get out there and dig in the dirt if you're not feeling good and i, th- I think you'll probably feel better <laughs> and come out and see us at Bates nursery and garden center where we are now open on sundays noon to four we'll be open tomorrow so we invite you to come out and see us we are uh uh, as you see, we are stocked to the gills and more coming in daily, uh, new plant material. We've got our new structure that we are working on. We don't have the covers on it yet, but we're getting very close to getting that underway. So we're going to uh, be able to uh, provide an in the dry and a uh, somewhat climate controlled during the cold season part of the mm-hmm. year. So we're really mm-hmm. looking forward to be able to fully present that to you. Uh, going forward over through the fall season. So come out and see us at Bates Nursery and Garden Center, where we are conveniently located one mile north of Briley Parkway at exit 19 on White's Creek Pike. Now, that's just minutes from Rivergate, Opry Mills, Nashville West, downtown Nashville. And I promise you, no matter where you're coming from, it's worth the drive from anywhere. Uh, check out our website, BatesNursery.com, and uh, come out and uh, uh, help us celebrate our Emerald anniversary. That's right. This is our 90th year of business at Bates Nursery and Garden Center. We're really uh, privileged to be able to say that, and we appreciate the support we get and have gotten for all these many decades beautifying Nashville since 1932, Bates Nursery and Garden Center. Thank you for giving us a moment to discuss that and uh, hopefully help you in your gardening efforts. All right. And getting back into it, uh, Crooked Letter Roots uh, commented on Instagram, can we plant blueberries and blackberries in the fall? Oh, what yes. What say ye? Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Do it. Resounding yes. Mm-hmm. Well, all of them. Yes, all of them. Please do. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to be planting some uh, <clears throat> baby cakes uh, 
uh, blackberries here uh, another week or so. And then I've also got a, what was that new one we got in? Uh, um, Loch Ness, I think, uh, in the spring. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Blackberry, I got one of those I'm going to huh. plant. So uh, I probably have a few too many blueberries, but we did get in <laughs> some uh, pink lemonade in one gallon yesterday on that fruit uh, tree uh, truck. Did. Oh, did and I, yes. I, lo- I love that one. I'm going to probably get another couple of those. So. I've got a customer now, looking for you, one of those. Are, are you guys seeing it being necessary to uh, add sulfur to soils? For I do. Who are I, I've, with blueberries in particular, yeah. they they do better. The the fruit sets better. Um, <clears throat> I usually use just holly tone is what I've used right. in the past because uh, it's got more sulfur in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I you know I haven't done it. Um, I did it for the first five or six years and I have kind of slacked off, but. So I didn't have as good a berry set this year, so I can attest to that. Y- yes, you need to to stay on that. So, and for those who don't understand what we're talking about, uh, blueberries are a, an acidic loving plant. They would really prefer to have a pH down around well, down to five point five. Yep. It could be do yep. well, but and not above six point five. Mm-hmm. And in order to do that. You have to, uh, the best way to change the pH is uh, by adjusting the level of sulfur that's mm-hmm. available. And uh, the fertilizer Adam just mentioned, Holly Tone, is, has sulfur in it, which helps to, uh, and I believe, is that elemental sulfur or is well, it it's, in I'm like not sure how magnesium it's, sulfate it's or, or some yeah, other it's, form? Well, it's organically derived. It has to be. So I don't know what, okay. what form it is, mm-hmm. but it well, works great. I also use it on my Green Giants for the first seven or eight years they were in the ground so yeah, conifers um, also uh, tend to like a lower ph yeah. but the blueberries require it so yes. if, if you're yes if you've got blueberries and they're not doing as well as uh, you would like for them to do could be that they also are sun lovers they're you know they'll take some shade yeah but it'll probably get a penalty on how much fruit you get correct produced. correct yep. yeah all right yep. uh donna on the at home show page is asking are the pansies in now Yes, yes, they yeah. are. Yes, they are. We got are. some right up here, actually. And there's more on the way. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. it's pansy time, y'all. So we have officially kicked that off this and, year. And uh, violas. Don't mm-hmm. forget violas. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. They're right there There's too. Little faces. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, can I can I segue when we're talking about edibles? Yes. yes. I sure. sent Tyler a picture. Okay. It's in <laughs> so. Oh. <laughs> here it comes. Hold on, then. I'm going <laughs> over to you, Joy. In celebration of fall. Last night I made. Oh yeah. A lovely I was, dish. I was disappointed. I was, I, was, I, didn't, mm. I was disappointed I didn't get any of that at my house. So. <laughs> what is that? So what, it's, what, it was what? a fall creation I made last night. It's turkey meatloaf with sage and rosemary. And Yum. then butternut squash medley, which I actually grew here on the property. We had a little kind of structure in the back that we were That's tinkering with. That's what you with. did with that yeah. squash. So mm. butternut squash, golden raisins, hazelnuts, apples, which was honey crisp and okay. Granny Smith, mm. feta and parsley, and just a good old big slice of the cranberry sauce that you get in the can. <laughs> right. And nice. topped with ranch. It was delicious. Nice. <laughs> That's a wow. beautiful picture. So, yeah. yeah. It almost looks bad. like dessert. It's uh, very fun so to grow how, what you eat. Uh, okay. So how did it taste? Let me t- ask, tell us that. It was delicious. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. I, I sure really it enjoyed was. it. And it's for lunch today. Nice. Ho! Oh, Always but, good to have well, you know, The good, great thing about things that are fresh and that you've made yourself, you know, they naturally taste better. And you can have it in successive meals and you don't get tired of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You just go, gosh, this is the last gosh. one I'm going to get to have for quite a while. I need to really savor it. <laughs> yep. That's the I, special I, thing about gardening this yes. time of year. You know, yes. the, all those things are, you know, we know that the end is coming not so far away yep. with regard to harvesting. So uh, really savor it and enjoy that experience. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, we have... Still quite a few more questions and just a little bit of time, so I'm kind of going to whip through these here. Best bang for your buck with unique foundational plants? All right. Best bang for your buck is going to be... Abelia. uh, Abelia is a good one. It's cheap. Uh, All sorts of hollies if you really just want to go that route. Um Clay, get the uh, most Clay era, Clay era. If you got oh, a big yeah. foundation, you know Shannon, yeah. who works with us, has literally said that yesterday. He said the most attractive plant for the money mm-hmm. is Clay era, and agree. it's a, it's a pretty large shrub for only like twenty four ninety nine, twenty nine ninety nine for a three gallon, for yeah. a three gallon mm-hmm. shrub. It's pretty big. Yes, by far, good bang for your buck. On evergreen, that. also. Yep, it is evergreen yep. on really harsh nice winters. It can foliage. get a little. Uh, 
on the tops, but you can prune those back and they flush right back out. So, um, yeah, those are three good ones. <laughs> All right, here is a follow up to that one from the same person. Favorite foundational plants that are native to Tennessee Ooh. and good for fall planting. We have a Maryland dwarf. Uh, it holly. Is a, yeah, it's yeah. a holly. Uh, Alex yep. Opaca, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That it gets, still gets big, but it's short. It's another one. Yeah, another good one, too. Another good one, Joy, if you got shade, would be Lakothway. Um, mm. That's a native uh, feather bush. Yeah. So. Yeah. Unfortunately, though, we don't have a ton of evergreens, sh- like shrub things that are They're really native, native no. here. No. Uh, we just no. don't work. berry is one more, but yeah. other than that, yep. yeah, you just have to accept that things are going to drop. Well, leaves. don't yeah. forget about rhododendrons. Mm. <laughs> the native If ones. you dare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you have some shade, you too. Could, you, you might even consider prickly pear cactus. That's true. Hey. Oh, there you go. Hey. Good one, David. Uh-huh. Hey, that's a shout out to old Caroline. She's not here today. She's <laughs> on a show, but she loves her prickly pear cactus. Yeah. We, She's yeah. got it in her yard with some lambs here, actually. So hope Caroline's doing well. I've got to help with the houseplants in Caroline's world. So hopefully anybody coming out for houseplants, I'm going to try to help you. But we don't have the have the expertise like we usually do this weekend. Uh, you'll be fine. Also. Nah, we'll be fine. Just got to keep it watered. There is a, a quick question from CGDC official, which might be affiliated with Miss Caroline Gant. Uh-oh. How become <laughs> Caroline gets so smart? <laughs> what? I don't uh, know. It's you a know, mystery. It is, but she absorbed a lot of intelligence along the way. It's a, it's a mystery wrapped in an enigma. <laughs> That's right. Well, I think, Caroline, like all the rest of us, you know, you when you start down the path of uh, interest in plants, you you really uh, it's captivating and you realize how, no matter how much you learn there's a uh, almost infinite amount more to learn mm-hmm. whether it be very like basic second. information or very mm-hmm. nuanced things uh, it's a rabbit hole that uh, you Doesn't can just end. continue to go down right? yep. yes and uh, kicking it back to plants caterpillars on dogwood shrubs yeah. good or bad bugs so bad. we could speak to that uh oh yeah bt third side yeah. that's what you got to use yeah. to, to get rid of it's the, it's the larvae of a sawfly guys yeah. it's going to happen every year it happens to us we, oh, yeah. we see it out yeah. here on our lot you're, yeah. you're we're no different so yep. bt applications two courses of action you can spray them or you can leave them mm-hmm. leaving them it will flush back out mm-hmm. once their life cycle's done. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, and, by and way, with, with BT that, is Bacillus thuringiensis. So right. for mm-hmm. those who don't know what we're talking about, it is a uh, a naturally occurring bacteria bacteria that is very effective as an insecticide yep. mm-hmm. against uh, caterpillar specifically. Specifically, yes. yeah. <clears throat> specifically yep. those, yes. Mm-hmm. All right, and here's another bug one: hydrangea leaves getting stripped. Bugs, what to do? Could be deer, but uh, could, <laughs> could be, um, or yeah, probably is another caterpillar or, in, or a larva of some type, probably. Yeah. There's a lot of larvae that aren't really host. There's a lot of plants, yep. or, you know, caterpillars that are host specific that only get on certain things, kind of like our, that dogwood we were just talking about. Our then, native hydrangea is host to nine Levidopter species. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So there's a number of caterpillars that can come in, and one or two or three caterpillars can make some pretty good damage, you mm-hmm. know, over the course of two or three days if you don't help it. So, um, yeah, probably insect issues. And like you said, we can use a B- BT to spray with. Or hand picking, or simply leaving them, and yep. just accepting that plants can, you know, well, deal with some damage. Uh, I know Joy will like this, but uh, you know, birds feed mm. almost exclusively on caterpillars, yeah. almost exclusively. In the spring and summer months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, depends. <laughs> you could let nature take its course. That's, That's right for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that is all the questions that we have. So hey. we, the pressure is off for Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Hey, well. On that note, then we'll uh, we'll just kind of do a little wrap up here. We are approaching the uh, top of the hour here. I'll remind you that uh, we have lots going on at Bates Nursery. We're now open seven days a week, uh, noon until four on Sundays, nine until four Monday through Saturday. Uh, Chances are. We have what you're looking for. If you're curious about that, go out to our website, BatesNursery.com. Everything we have for sale is out there on the website, not just for viewing. You can actually purchase it, arrange for delivery right there while you're on the website. So make sure and check that out. It might, might be that you don't have the time to come out or you just want to get a heads up on what is available. That's updated in real time. So 
uh, when we sell something, it goes away. And when we get something in, it shows up. So check that out often if you're curious about that. I believe, and I have we haven't talked about this at all, our Isley truck is coming in next, next week, week, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Supposedly. Yeah, and that's always a very exciting mm. time. Yes. So if you're uh, interested in uh, conifers, unusual conifers and Japanese, Japanese maples, maples yep. uh, those will be in... Hopefully by this time next weekend, we will have those to uh, talk about in specificity. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, come out and see all the other wonderful things we've got. Uh, we bring them in just for you. and with. But despite all the variety of plants we have, expertise is really where we shine. And so bring us your questions. We we answer a few, but it's only a few, uh, once a week here on the show. Uh, speaking of questions, David, we got one last one here from Joy yeah. Lewis Hassler. Is there Joy. Okay. is there another Joy? <laughs> is there any way to make a crepe myrtle quit sending out suckers? Yeah. Let it mature. That's what. That's really all you can do. Is the older it gets, the less suckers it'll send out. And uh, but if it gets hit really hard by by a late freeze, like in the spring or something, it doesn't matter what how big it is it will it'll it'll die back some and send yeah, out suckers and so. i would say you know, the the other thing is just stay on top yep. of rolling yep. off that little sucker girl while they're tender they're very mm-hmm. easy to peel off yep. if you'll continue to do that they eventually will stop yep. and they're much easier to do don't let them get up a foot tall or two feet mm-hmm. Take, yeah. Keep them peeled off as soon as they're budding out. Yeah. You can just roll them off with your fingers. Very easy. Probably yeah. have to go out every two or three days and, and do it. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know. All righty. All right. Hey, that fruit tree it. people. People that want fruit trees. You're all over the place. Come out and get them. We got the best selection yes, in town. We do. Yes, we do. Yes. Tons of them. All right. Well, thank you all. And uh, and we want to say uh, get well soon, Josh. We hope you are continue to be on the man. Yes, for sir. all of us here, the whole uh, Bates crew here that we have on the show today, we want to thank you for tuning in. And invite you to come out and see us. Uh, and tune in next time here on the At Home Show. Uh, hopefully, really quickly, we'll, we'll have Josh Carey back in here with us. And I'm sure he'll have a full report on whatever it is he's been involved in in his absence. So for uh, Josh Carey and myself and all the cast here at Bates Nursery, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon.